This program is sponsored by Maronite College of the Holy Family, Parramatta. Educating for Success, filmed right here at Maronite College of the Holy Family. I'm Sister Margaret, the principal of the college. Today we're going to discuss a bit about what's happening in primary education. And with me today we've got two special guests. We have Mrs Danielle Rafour. Welcome, Danielle. Thank you, Sister. And we have Mrs Angel Dagar. Welcome, Angel. Thank you, Sister. I'm going to ask you both about, you know, both of you are stage coordinators, so what does that stage involve in primary? So we'll start with Angel, because you're stage one coordinator. So if you would yep. like to explain what's a stage one coordinator and what they actually teach at that level. Well, in early stage one, stage one, <coughs> excuse me, we predominantly start with the emergent, um, working with the syllabuses at every time, at each point. The new curriculum is being implemented as well, um, working at the different stages, whether it be early stage one, or stage one, which incorporates year one and year two. Um, we look at all the different KLAs. Um, we have a lot of, ver a, a wide variety of um, programs which we implement, multi-lit being one for year two. We're looking at reading recovery or mini-lit for year one to recover the children that have lacked in the literacy side of things. Um, and in kindergarten, pretty much, we focus on the emergent child. We give them the benefit of the doubt um, before we start testing or, or targeting them, giving them the first year as leeway. But a lot of immersion, a lot of children's work, a big, um, strong focus on phonics, thanks to you, sister. We had a, a wonderful PD last Friday with um, Jolly Phonics and Tina Damaro. A lot of teachers are on board with that and we'll be implementing uh, that, a big focus on that as well. Um, with the mats, we work with the centre and the Count Me In Two program. We evaluate with the centre testing and we group the children as per their ability and work with the Count Me In Two resources from the Dens books, generate a lot of um, activities where they consolidate their learning in mats through concrete materials and you know, the ability to transfer information from their, their head onto paper and tell us what it is that they've done, the processes they've used. Also, we do running records to, to, to monitor the children on their guided reading, for guided reading um, reasons. We group the children again in their ability groups. Um, we have, we're incorporating literacy blocks as well, so we're focus, focusing on all the different components of literacy. Um, so we're moving forward quite quickly um, and emphasising um, the children who need that intervention. Early intervention, as we all know as educators, is probably um, one of the most important factors in education long term for the child to become an independent learner. But um, also with um, all the way we test, it's not just to differentiate, we just do that so that we can differentiate and target the children at their level to cater for the individual need. Um, for future learning, we look at making them more independent learners. We have the toolkit, which we incorporate in all of our KLAs, um, all subject areas, so that we can help children become better critical thinkers um, and become, like I said, independent learners. What about for the advanced students? Advanced student, students, the differentiation is also a catering for them. Um, we, we extend children, we have the extension program. Currently, I take year one and year two. Um, for extension once a week and in, within the classroom they are uh, definitely extended. We did have a couple of children who moved grades because they were able to be accelerated. Um, again, credit to you sister because it was your request but um, before that children were being able to go from grade to grade, upper grades, to further cater for their needs at their level so they're not hindered. 
um, and parents are aware of this. And we also have a strong focus on IT, which is the reading, eggs and mathletics being very much um, focused on, especially for homework and that plan resourcing as well as being available so that the students can get the most well-rounded um, ability to approach tests like NAPLAN and, and other things. Okay, thanks Angel. Thank you. Danielle, Stage 3 Coordinator. So the, the learning areas are the same for Stage 3 as they are for... Do you want to uh, explain what Stage 3 is for our listeners? Uh, stage 3 is Year 5 and 6, so um, they're doing all the same subjects as Early Stage 1, Stage 1 and Stage 2. Uh, we have a main priority this year on literacy specifically. We've been doing a lot of work in that area. Um, excitingly, we've also got new syllabuses. We've got the new mathematics syllabus and the new science syllabus, which we are in the process of implementing. And next year comes the history syllabus, which is very different from what we've done in previous years. It replaces a component of the uh, HESI, or um, Human Society and its Environment syllabus, so we'll be implementing all those changes, making sure that our programs and the resources that we have for them are meeting the needs of all of our children, as you said, for those ones who need some support as well as those who need to be extended. Um, like Angel, I take the extension students for Stage 3. Last term we looked at the ANZAC history and students did uh, problem-based learning activities based on ANZAC. And this term we're looking at more mathematics, some open-ended tasks to really challenge them and meet all of their individual needs. Okay, now you mentioned maths. I know you're moving away from textbooks to yes. more practical hands-on. How's yes. that going and how do, you, how, do you, how do you teach maths without a textbook? With maths, I think we have to first and predominantly teach them the, the vocab, the vocabulary. Once they understand the vocab, the, the concepts of the maths, we use concrete material or, you know, word problems pending on the stage and the ability of the child. And then the child will actually be taught different strategies, bridging to 10, jump strategy, number busting, or, or a, a, a whole range of mathematical concepts, which later on in time become a mental process that they can tap into quickly and solve problems easier. Um, what they do then is transfer the knowledge onto paper. So in actual fact, the child is explaining to you. We've got a lot of open-ended questioning that we do undertake with the students um, during this learning process um, to help them show understanding of what that maths, what, why they gave us the answer that they did um, in a way that helps generate um, a broader mind um, and better concentration skills. Uh, the children have more ownership of their own learning and in, in saying that they're able to justify their learning or then we can prompt them to maybe go that little bit further and, and look at different um, aspects of maths. Okay. And then and mostly I think is the ability to relate maths to their everyday life, mm -hmm. um, shopping, uh, 2D shapes, 3D shapes in their environment all those sorts of things makes them more aware of maths as in, in general life as well. So times tables that we used to have to learn off by heart, is that still part of the... Yeah, I think it is still. Yeah. Um, there's an aspect of um, one of the skills in the new math syllabus is fluency. Yes. So like in reading, there's fluency. In mathematics, there needs to be fluency. Exactly. So that's one of the skills that we're teaching them. And it is related to addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, by easily recalling those facts, you're able to do higher order questions and tasks relating mm. it to other areas like multiplication, um, beg your pardon, area, things like that. Yeah. So we are still teaching times tables. <laughs> but not yeah. in isolation, not yeah. by rote learning. Rote learning doesn't show them the process of yeah. um, skip counting. So when they skip count, they see how a number gets bigger. Yeah. And as we know, as educators, I think mathematics, addition, subtraction, you can't go one without the other and it's the same with multiplication division. Yeah. When they see that inverse um, relationship between those numbers or the way numbers can be used, um, they get a stronger understanding, be able to build mm. on that. Yeah, so it's learning how to work out a problem step by step, right. which is Apply important yeah. in secondary Applying as well. Applying those yeah. skills in many areas, yeah. that's yeah. the key. Um, and that's what we're trying to build by getting rid of 
textbooks mm. and introducing a new style of teaching. Yes. We're hoping to make better problem solvers. That's Just in that. maths? In all areas, in I all think. Areas. Yeah. yeah. Okay. More tangent thinking, a lot more open-ended thinking, mm. ability to solve a problem um, with their own devices. Mm. Um, you know, and ability to understand how. So are there any new techniques happening in English then or is it pretty much still reading the textbook, reading a novel, discussing? Uh, well, we've introduced multimodal literacy. Mm. So it's not just about books, although books are incredibly important and we have uh, a range of resources that we offer the students by way of shared reading, guided reading, home reading. Mm. But we also use multimodal, um, looking at websites, looking at newspapers, okay, looking yeah. at magazines. Mm. And also for homework, we've now introduced some online forums. Um, yes. Reading Eggs is one of those. And it's a fantastic program because each child takes a start-up test and that means their homework is then directed exactly at their ability, their ability. level. Uh, and every child's needs are being met. We also have an online uh, homework program for mathematics as well called Mathletics, which the children absolutely love. They have uh, homework rates have never been as high just because the children are loving getting their hands on their iPad yeah. Yeah. or the computer know, in order know, to do their work. It's mm -hmm. their second skin these days. Yeah. You've got the iPad, it just comes part and parcel with your they child, know, I think. They know, more, they know yeah. more than us about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Talking about technology. How else have we used it in our in the primary curriculum? Well, we we are looking. We've at the moment we're using them um, with the multimodal learning. Yep. A lot of children are able to um, tap into apps that help them in different areas of language. Like it might be reading, it might be um, you know maths, anything on that level. Any any of the KLAs, they can search up anything and, and pretty much do a bit of like a project based type learning where they go off and they try to find information and research. We're very, research lucky, here. Yeah. We're very yeah. lucky here. We've got um, interactive whiteboards in all of As the well. classrooms. Yeah. We've got over 50 iPads that teachers can borrow out. We've got laptops that students can access. How have they been going, the new laptops? Are they popular? Uh, I haven't seen the borrowing yet. No. They're, they're just so <laughs> brand new. They've still got the plastic on them, but no. I know the teachers. I know. Can I know they've been. I know that everything's been called into the library so that we can implement the new borrowing yep. Yep. Um, process. So that I'm sure teachers are keen mm. and can't wait to get their well, hands on them. We've always got to increase our IT. Now mm -hmm. let's just go back back a bit with kindy orientation. Uh, so kindy go through an orientation process. What is, what's some advice you can give parents to prepare their young children for kindy? First and foremost, independence. And that only comes from um, giving them little chores at home, setting the table, counting how many forks or knives they need, how many plates they need to put out. Simple things like setting the table, making their bed, you know, making their bed automatically eventually they will see that as a rectangle or a square because, or unless, you know, they've got a circular bed. Mm -hmm. um, but little, little tasks to help their child take responsibility for their actions and be able to become self-sufficient, I think that's important. Also read to your children, make it, model it to the T. And not just, oh, it's something that you have to do now, do it naturally, just let it flow. If you're sitting on a couch, oh, I'd love to read that book sort of thing, model it so that you're showing um, that you enjoy reading and that you value it. And if we value reading in front of our children, um, then they'll end up valuing it as well. Uh, going to the library, little field trips, um, talking to their children about what they've done during the day. Generally have conversations with your children so that they can um, promote their order of thought, you know. Um, They'll do lots and lots of literacy recounts and personal stuff where they have to rehash what's happened and a lot of the times they can't put that into sequence. Um, other things they could do, I think, um, even mats, like I said, counting out cutlery, anything like that is important. Um, IT, definitely. Let your children, obviously with adult supervision, let your children access the IT. Let them, there's so much out there, it's not limited to what a school gives you, so many resources that you can tap into to help promote your child, what, you know, sound recognition, number, one-to-one -one correspondence, there's so much out there that your child 
um, can be open to. Yeah, so it's better, better prepared. Better prepared when they yes. begin in school. Yeah. Well, thank you. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I think we'll be having another guest uh, stage two coordinator with us. Wonderful. Thank you, thank thank you, you sister. Sure. This program is sponsored by Maronite College of the Holy Family, Parramatta. What do you do if your child has too much homework? To make the learning for the students better, more engaging. What do you do if your child does not have homework? And we equip the children as per their ability. Do you prefer the traditional methods of teaching? And here we've got um, interactive whiteboards in all of as the well. classrooms. Yeah. If you want answers to these questions, watch our program Educating for Success with Sister Margaret Lawson, the Principal of Maronite College of the Holy Family, Parramatta, on Midpoint TV. Welcome back to Educating for Success. In the studio we have with us Mrs. Danielle Rufu and joining us now is Mrs. Megan Averley. How are you going, Megan? Well, thank you, sister. We were discussing with Angel and Danielle before about the stage call, stage levels and what, what's taught at those levels. So you're stage two coordinator, which is year three and four. Yes. Do you want to explain a bit about what's taught at those levels? In year three and four, they start delving into a little bit more in maths and English, what they're doing. So they're increasing in their reading levels. They're doing some more advanced work in mathematics, um, dealing with higher order numbers, addition and multiplication and division, a lot more problem solving. In year four, we start our extension maths group. So the students are levelled for mathematics. Um, that's working well so far. That's been a new initiative that started this year. Um, if year three, of course, also have a very big event in their first Holy Communion, which will be coming up later this year. And we're looking forward to celebrating and we're starting to plan and prepare for that now. And also in year three and four, we start initiating some of our extracurricular sporting activities with um, the lo other local schools, Catholic schools in the Parramatta area. Okay, so it's a lot, it's a lot more fun, is it, than yes. kindy on year two? It <laughs> gets a little bit more interesting, definitely. Okay, now year three and year five sit the NAP plan. Yes. Which is next week, actually. So do you want to talk a bit about what NAP plan is and uh, how you prepare the students for that? Right, NAP plan is a national assessment for literacy and numeracy. Um, students in year three, five, seven and nine in Australia complete it. It looks at, um, there are four different assessments. One's writing conventions, there's a writing assessment, reading and then numeracy. So it is an assessment of their skill in general and we try not to over prepare the children too much and stress them out. However, we need to give them some experience of what a standardised test like NAPLAN can be like. So students do complete uh, preparation tests, uh, old NAPLAN tests, things like that, to give them some exposure to it before the assessment. Um, they do very well. They actually quite enjoy the stimulus that the, the tests include and, and they use those in class after as well. Um, some of them do get a little bit nervous, but we try and explain to them that it is an assessment and like any assessment, all they need to do is try their hardest. So. We can use the data from that as well. All the information and results we get from the children's tests get sent to the school, get sent to the parents, and we can use that data to help us better plan for what we would like to do next within the college to help develop those skills in reading and mathematics. Okay, now we're talking about tests here. We've got the NAPLAN test. Does, do you in primary run any other tests? Do you have like yearly exams or half yearly exams or that's not, we, not on? Not, not yearly not and half yearly, yearly anymore? No, not like high school. <laughs> no. Um, no. We do ongoing assessment, so we talk in the new syllabuses about um, assessment for learning, as learning and of learning. So we do a combination of assessments. Some of them are uh, standard pen to paper tests, some of them are more open-ended tasks, projects, assignments, things like that. Some of them are presentations. Um, I've seen classes do um, drama performances as assessments, not just for drama, but also for their history or their science, things like that. And we also have general observation. Um, teachers spend a lot of time recording observations about students in order to 
explain to their parents and the students themselves how to better their learning and how to improve in various areas. We're also embracing technology too, so we've done a lot of, a lot of students are now doing projects involving making things on the iPad like iMovies to demonstrate their knowledge and understanding, so getting more of a technology push through the college as well. Do you do across the form ex tests or assessments or is it just based in, in class? We, do, it's, we do, do generally, all teachers are encouraged in the grade and they do work collaboratively together, so it's agreed upon within the grade what mm. they will be testing and how they will be testing that okay, from grade so, to grade. Okay, so there's, like there's one consistency, Good. yes. Um, we have four streams of each grade. How often do those grades work together or in groups or is it generally just classroom work? Every, um, every grade runs the same program. Some things lend themselves to being more in the classroom by themselves. I know every grade does grade sport together. They go out together and, and use the resources. Reading groups. Uh, reading groups are across different classes. Do you want to explain a bit more what reading groups is about? Students are levelled based upon their ability to read and understand a text. The most important thing is understanding what they're reading. Based on that, we come up with what's called a reading age or a reading level, and we group the children accordingly. So all of the children of the same group or age will be placed together to work to their ability level, and that might mean that they might go to a different classroom during that reading session time to work at their level for their understanding. Now, talking about levels, I know this year we've decided to put uh, Year 5 and Year 6 into maths levels. And Year 4. And, and year English. Four. I, I mean, it was both maths and English, wasn't it? Yes. How's that going? Because previously it was just mixed groups, mixed ability. Um, I think it's going well. What we've, what we've done is rather than have a 1, 2, 3, 4, we've, we've got a, um, a, a top group that the teacher is able to work with at a faster pace than the rest of the cohort. Um, the teacher of the top group is able to extend them, give them much more difficult tasks than the rest of the grade. The rest of the grade is then mixed. Okay. So um, we, wouldn't, we didn't really want to create a lowest group because we wouldn't want that stigma for the mm. children to, mm. to think, oh, well, I'm not good enough. But having a top group just makes that group really proud and the rest of them know that they're still doing the work of the year six. So okay. there's no yep. issues there. One other thing we haven't touched upon, we teach Arabic also in primary. Do you want to say anything about that? Arabic is um, one of the great things about the college. It's the chance for the children to learn a second language, which is, I think is something fantastic for their future understanding. Some of them find it a little challenging because it's more of a... Um, it's not the conversational Arabic that they're used to, it's much more formal, but some of them really embrace it. We do start levelling them, like with some of the upper primary from year four to year six, they're placed in levelled groups. Within K to three, they stay within their classroom groups and we have some great Arabic staff. We have celebrate a lot of events like um, Independence Day and we have a lot of songs and prayers and celebrations that they learn through their Arabic lessons. I think it's a great initiative. Okay. The other topic, religion. How's that taught in the primary? Well, it, it's our seventh KLA in a, in a, D, a public school. They don't teach religion. They may have um, time for scripture, but here it's, it's an everyday part of our um, school culture. We say prayers in the morning. We say prayers together before we eat, before we're dismissed in the afternoon. We speak about being good Christians to each other on a regular basis. We try and involve... Um, the ethos of the college and its very strong faith in everything that we do. And then we also have separate religion lessons. We look at the Maronite aspect here. Uh, we also look at the gospel and how it's taught and how it relates to us still is a really important thing that we're teaching the students. And we've still got, we've got the celebration of the Mass. We celebrate a lot of Masses as well at the college. We do um, participate in the Sacraments of Reconciliation and First Holy Communion. And a lot of preparation is done through the college, whereas a lot of other schools the um, parish. parish does mm. the preparation. So that's one of the things that the teachers, it's not just the teachers on those grades that are involved, the whole school and staff gets involved in those and we look forward to celebrating with the children every year. Yeah, Holy Communion is a big thing it for us, isn't it? It is a very big thing. It's, it's coming up very soon. About 100 young boys and girls ready for their Holy Communion. <laughs> it's, a it's a nice thing though to watch, I think, every year. Yeah. Everyone likes to come and participate in the yeah. Mass and see yeah. them grow. Okay, Year 6, final year of primary, yes. they think they're the bosses of the school of course, yes. but then they're moving on to into secondary. How do you prepare primary students in this transition into high school? We're very, very fortunate here. Being a K-12 college, we have the unusual ability to have members of the high school 
come into the primary school and give lots of information to the students to prepare them for going into secondary. Um, the welfare coordinator of the high school, Ellie Asma, he comes in three times in year five and four times in year six. Various teachers from all the different um, subjects in high school also come in. The students get an opportunity to go into our high school and, and tour the fantastic um, resources that we have and the rooms that are available, science labs and music rooms and food tech, te food tech you name it, they go and they absolutely love it. Because of that, they get really excited about high school. High school isn't scary for children in our school going from year six into year seven. It's something they really look forward to. Um, as you say, they think they're the bosses. It's so cute seeing them the next year as well, being the tiny little ones in high school though. And as a teacher, it's really, really good that we get to see the students go from kindergarten all the way to year 12. It's really, really, really lovely to see. And when then they come and visit us again and we know that they're, you know, lawyers and doctors and teachers yeah. and yeah. builders and all sorts of fantastic things. But transitioning into high school here, we're in a unique position that it really is a seamless process from mm. year six into mm. year seven. Talking about transition, uh, this is probably the last question. You know how I'm trying to create a K to 12 seamless and where, I, like I said, our secondary classes, you know, mingling with the primary. We've seen that maybe with um, the food tech where I think year nine students created a food bazaar for the, for the kindies. What other examples have there been where high school and primary have worked together? Well, we've had some examples when we've um, worked with looking at music and drama, um, getting some of the drama students to come and present to the primary. Obviously, um, musical presentations that the children can go and watch. Every year, the high school does a fantastic expo that they're a primary are invited to come and be a part of. Some of the students model for the textiles um, from the primary to showcase their work. Um, there's a lot of things that we can still do as well. Mm. It's, you know, we're just sort of starting. I know we're looking at possibly getting the year four students to go into the, the secondary labs and, and have a look at lessons being conducted mm. and maybe meet with the secondary yep. science teachers. So little by little, more and more we can do as, as we get the time and work together as a staff from K to 12 as well. And I know within Prime, you've got like um, year six working with kindy, kindy buddies, whatever That's they right. call them. Yep. Yep. We also have um, recently Year 9 have worked with Year 4 yes. doing some peer support activities. Uh, every year the Year 12s come down to the Year 6s as part of the transition program to mentor them as they're about to enter high school. And you know they're, they're all really, really close to each other already. Yeah. A lot of these children, they catch buses together, That's right. their yep. family friends, their neighbours. Mm. Mm. So because they're moving into that high school supported and surrounded by people they already know, they do really well. Yep. Okay, we're going to pretty much end off the program. Anything else you'd like to say about the primary? What, you think, what do you think is one of the greatest things about the primary? I think that one of the greatest things about the primary is the staff who really do drive the, the primary department to work together to create change, to, to make the learning for the students better, more engaging, um, I think getting those teams of people and just watching the passion that some teachers have for their job every day, even when it's the toughest of days, they'll still walk out with a smile on their face. I think it's a lot to do with the staff. Okay. I also think that we have an incredible parent group here. We have over 100 volunteers who come into our school on a regular basis to help in classrooms, in reading, in maths, in sport, in drama for fundraisers, for excursions, for if, if you could name it, the parents would be prepared to put their hands up to do it. And that sort of support is really atypical in this day and age and we're very, very lucky to have yeah. those parents. We are. It's true. And I, I think you sum it up, we are a family, not just a school, we're a community, but more so very much a family with parents, students, staff all working together. It is, it is. Thank you, sister. Thank you, Megan. Thanks. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you. And we'll see you next time on Educating for Success. Thank you.
I welcome you to the Maronite College of the Holy Family in Parramatta. My name is Sister Margaret Gosson, the Principal of the College, and I invite you to watch our 12 episodes discussing education for success.